Loving Jesus must capture our imagination. Loving Jesus must capture our visualization. Using the imagination of the soul helps to stir our affections for Jesus and grow in our love for him. Love Jesus with your soul. Next on Leading the Way. Now, scientists have been telling us for years that the left side hemisphere of the brain is the side that is associated with logical analysis, uh, rational judgments. The right side of the brain hemisphere is associated with visual imagery, uh, word pictures, uh, creativity, and emotional response. Some have left side hemisphere dominance, some have right side hemisphere dominance. Well, by now, probably some of you, I know you well enough to know, some of you are saying, Michael, what has this got to do with loving Jesus? <laughs> and growing in your love for Jesus, which is the series that we have begun several weeks ago. A great deal, but I'm glad you asked. Understanding ourselves and understanding our differences from others, it helps us a great deal to know that different people respond differently to the gospel. There are some people respond to the love of God, some people respond to the judgment of God that different people respond to the gospel differently. Uh, some people express their love for God differently. Some people express their love for one another differently. Under the leading of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to communicate with those who are right side and those who are left side brain dominance. To those who are left side brain dominance, I try to communicate with rational and logical thoughts. And to those who are right side brain dominance, I like to try to communicate with uh, imagination and visualization and imaging and so forth. In this series, we began with the mind. Love God with all your mind, the seat of the intellect. That, 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 that's the left side dominance. I love God with all your heart. That is your personality, your emotion. That's the right side dominance. And today, I want to talk to you about loving God with your soul. Remember the Bible talks about in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, the imagination of all their soul is evil. Now, we want to talk about the imagination of your soul to be all holy today. Amen? Amen. Loving Jesus must capture our imagination. Loving Jesus must also capture our emotion. Loving Jesus must capture our visualization. Listen, I'm painfully aware of the fact that because of abuses, I'm aware of that, even in the Christian church, the abuses of imagination and visualization concept, that some people, those folks in the Reformed tradition like me, um, because of the abuses, they tend to throw the baby with the bathwater. What do I mean by this? Now, those who are mostly or only challenged with the logical analysis of the Scripture, they look at these abuses of imagination and visualization and say, see, see what happens? when you do not only, only, only use logical analysis, and they look down their noses at those who are drawn to visual imageries of the Scripture. 
And those who are motivated by visual imagery of the Word of God accuse those who mostly react with the logical analysis side as cold and emotionless. And so, my beloved friend, here's the truth. They both are right and they both are wrong. Is that double talk? No. Hear me right. If we love one another, we must accept the fact that we do not all respond in the same way. Uh, if we truly love one another, we must accept the fact that those whose thinking process differ from ours, they're not bad or crazy or cold or nuts or inferior. They're different. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, what is the application for those millions of people watching in Kingdom Sat all around the world and for those watching online and for here in this wonderful sanctuary? What is the application here? Please listen very carefully. Those who, tr who thrive on logical analysis of the Scripture should try to use their imagination. And those who are into imagination, visualization, must be controlled by the meaning of the text. Do not imagine anything that is not in the Scripture. And that, with that very brief introduction, I get to the message. <laughs> I always get to the message, but I like to set it up first. How do I love Jesus with all my imagination? The most important thing that I can tell you is this. Again, I repeat it. Never, 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 never make things up about Jesus other than what's in the Word of God, other than what's in the Scripture. I do not imagine or visualize things that are not in the infallible Word of God. You take what's in the Word of God and create a visual picture. Perhaps many of you have already gathered that this is where I am. I'm a lot more in this camp than I am in the analytical side. But perhaps more than any other in this series, today I'm sharing my heart with you, my own life. Because imagination and visualization represents me more than anything else, and I just need to tell you that up front. So when I read the Word of God, when I read the Scripture, I often begin to visualize this, how the Creator of the universe went through that crucifixion week. When I begin to visualize that, literally, my mind is just cannot handle it. And I, but I do try to imagine what it was like, especially that I've been there many times now, and I, I, I've seen the sights, I've walked the streets, and I've, I, I've seen the places. I think of the day before the crucifixion, of how our Savior must have felt, how deeply in every level, he must have anguished at the abandonment of his friends. How must have felt when one of them sold him for the price of a slave? How one denied him and they all forsook him? I visualize the deep pain that our Lord 
must have experienced when his chief disciple promised never, never, even if they all leave him, he will never leave him, and then three times he denied any knowledge of him. I visualize that pain. How, as fully God, he knew that they will all forsake him, but as fully man, how that pained him. How the one through whom and for whom all the universe came into existence, and yet they slapped his holy face. How he must have felt the giver of every breath that we draw. They spat on him. I visualize what it's like during that sleepless night in Caiaphas's basement. It's really more of a dungeon. It's on the hole in the wall of the ceiling. I've been there many times. And there you're going to find Psalm 22, which supposedly our Lord re recited all night. And it's in more than 20 languages. Psalm 22. In that, in that I, I read it the first time I went to many years ago, but I've never been able to do it again. I always had somebody else to read it. But that was just the beginning. I visualize how he walked two and a half miles to and from trial sites. And then I remember that he did this for me. I tried to visualize what was like even before that in the Garden of Gethsemane where he was sweating, not sweat, but blood coming out of his pores, something that I've learned later that it's a phenomenon that's so rare that it only happens during some of the most excruciating stress. And he did this for me and for my sin. Then my biggest imagination races to that dreadful time before the crucifixion when he was being flogged, which is really the Roman method of exhausting their victim before the crucifixion. In fact, under Roman law, only women and senators are not allowed to be whipped like this. Then I try to visualize these short whips with straps, leather straps. And at the tip of each one of those straps, there is a sheep bone designed to tear into the skin. Most likely he received 39 of those because by law they wouldn't go to 40 because the 40th one's supposed to kill you. And he did this for me. The Romans generally stripped the victims of their clothes and they tied their hands above their head on an upright post. The back of the buttocks and the legs get whipped first. And he bore all of this for me. As the flogging would continue, these little sheep bones at the end of the straps would tear deep into the skin until the underlying skeletal muscles begin to tear. And he did this for my sin. Then came the crucifixion itself, an upright 
wooden post, about 200 pounds, is fixed to the ground. And the horizontal crossbar that would weigh about 100 pounds. It was customary those days that the condemned man would carry the crossbar because the post is already in the ground and location. Please listen to me. The creator of all the trees in the woods carried that crossbar from the flogging post to the location of the crucifixion. He carried that 100-pound crossbar, and he did this for my sin. And then I'd imagine the lack of food and water and sleep for a long period of time, and carrying that 100-pound crossbar for one-third of a mile. And he did this for me. At the site of the execution, by law, the victim was given bitter drink as a mild sedative. And then he was thrown on his back on the dirt in preparation for nailing his hand to that crossbar. And I think of the wounds from the scourging mixed with the dirt contaminating his wounds, and he did this for me. And with her arms outstretched, the nails, the wrists were nailed with spikes or about six to seven inches. And the reason they hammered the wrists, not the palms, because the palm would tear very quickly and would fall from the cross. And he hung in there for a while because they nailed the wrists. After both wrists were fastened to the spikes, to the crossbar, then that crossbar is lifted with the victim on it, on the steps. Then the feet were usually nailed directly to the front post. And he did all of this for me. Now, beloved, don't ever forget, this is the Lord of glory. This is the Lord of glory who did not have to leave the splendor of heaven who did not have to leave the glories of heaven. Jesus did not have to lay aside the robe of his glory and splendor. Jesus did not have to come to earth, but he came from heaven so that he might pay with his blood for my redemption. So he paid the penalty of my sin and yours. Someone will say, but Michael, then a lot of people tortured and suffered and died, and even before and after. Jesus, even today, there are people who are suffering torture all over the world. Yes, 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 yes. But most of them, if not all of them, don't have a choice. But he did. He did. Furthermore, none of them were sinless. None of them are sinless. None of them were the Son of the living God who eternally coexisted with the Father before all worlds. Uh, but Jesus is the one through whom and for whom all things were created. He had a choice. He chose to pay for my sin and yours. He didn't have to pay for his sin. He had no sin. He was not paying for his sin. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up, and I choose to lay it down for you. If you truly want to grow in your love for Jesus, 
you cannot escape the imagery of the cross. Visualizing the cross can only deepen your love for the one who gave his all for you and me. It's all about Christ filling our minds. It's all about emptying ourselves of self-worship and filling our minds with the one who gave his all for us. It's all about filling our minds with that indescribable and inexplicable love of God. It's filling our minds with that matchless love of Jesus for us. And after you fill your mind with his matchless, indescribable love, then ask yourself the following questions. Do I love him back anywhere near his love for me? Do I love him back with my all? Do I love him back sacrificially? Do I love him back unconditionally? Do I love him back with my possessions? Do I love him back with my energy? Do I love him back with my time? Do I love him back with my imagination? Jesus did not only die and rose again from the grave victoriously on the third day to save us eternally. That would have been enough. That's all we need. That's completely enough for, for our needs. But there is more, you see. He died to set us free from sin and the slavery of sin. He died to set us free from the punishment of sin. He died to redeem us. He died to justify us. He died to bless us. He died as our substitute. He died to heal us eternally. He died to adopt us by, to His Father as sons and daughters. He died to save us. He died to reconcile us with His Father. He died and rose again to assure us of our own resurrection and eternal life with Him forever. have questions about the Christian faith? Do you wonder about life after death, what it means to be saved, or what happens to your life if you choose to follow Jesus? Are you worried that you are too far gone for Jesus to save you? You are not alone. All of these are important questions, and we would love to help you answer them. If you have questions, need prayer, or want to talk to someone about your decision to receive God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, our trained pastors and counselors are equipped to help you answer these tough questions. At ltw.org Jesus, you will find the path to true peace through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Visit and see a clear explanation of God's plan for salvation. Find answers to common questions and resources to help you grow in your new faith or receive prayer and encouragement for any situation. Our counselors are standing by. Visit ltw.org slash Jesus and start your journey to find true peace in Christ today. As Dr. Yusuf prepares to continue evangelistic outreach in cities around the world, we reflect on the testimonies and encouragement from leading the way's 20th anniversary celebration in the United Kingdom. It's wonderful that Dr. Michael Youssef had hosted us here in London today for leading the way with such a diversity of nations represented, I think 13 nations represented. I'm really hoping this evening that people who have come here catch a sense of God stirring in their hearts, that when they leave from here, they're so stirred about Jesus being revealed in their lives. God is gonna meet people right where they are. I wonder tonight whether we can pray that a spark may be generated this evening that would light a flame of refire that would turn this great city upside down and then spread to the rest of the British Isles. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Michael Youssef. He is the most high God, Yahweh Roy. He is the Lord my ship. 
Everything you need is provided in Him, in His name. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ as your only Savior and Lord. Today is the day. It's never too late. I often say, as long as you have breath, it's never too late. And I'm so excited to hear about that vision that Dr. Michael has to reach one million new souls for the kingdom of God. It's an inspiration for me. It gives me hope that the Great Commission can be fulfilled in our generation. In a world so desperately in need of truth and hope, leading the way is meeting the challenge. Through our Vision 2025 campaign, we're witnessing dramatic impact across new technologies and audiences. One of the most challenging Vision 2025 initiatives is to reach the next generation for Christ. As a part of that effort, Leading the Way launched a podcast, Candid Conversations with Jonathan Youssef, which is now approaching its 200th episode. Already, Candid Conversations is in the top 1% of podcasts worldwide and has listeners in over 130 countries. Some episodes have even gone viral online, bringing in 1.2 million views on Instagram. Every week on Candid Conversations, Jonathan Youssef and special guests bring a biblical worldview to popular topics such as evangelism, false teachings, apologetics, dating and marriage, and more. Leading the Way is also expanding on the newest digital platforms, reaching the next generation right where they are with the hope of Jesus. With each passing year, the world keeps changing, but our calling is the same. Leading the way is right there on the cutting edge, adapting to the new tech and media landscape, using every tool to reach the world with the hope of Jesus. Contact us today to find out how you can join with Leading the Way's global outreach and become a part of what God is doing through this worldwide ministry. Visit ltw.org today to grow your relationship with Christ. Always reaching out to us. God is the one who always wants to bless us. God is the one who always trying to pursue us. Strengthen your faith as you watch, listen to, and read sound biblical teaching from Dr. Michael Youssef. New programs and articles are posted daily. Receive encouragement as you hear miraculous stories of God moving here at home and around the world through Vision 2025, a strategic ministry expansion plan to reach as many people as possible for Christ by 2025. Take a quick break and receive spiritual refreshment as you read one of Dr. Yusuf's daily e-devotionals. Everything on ltw.org can easily be shared through email or your favorite social media platform making it easier than ever to tell others about Christ. Visit ltw.org today. Be encouraged and join our global gospel movement. Passionately proclaiming uncompromising truth, leading the way with Dr. Michael Yusuf. thanks you for your faithful support through your continued prayers and gifts.